Hello and welcome to today's Center for Healthcare Strategies webinar, made possible by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Kaiser Permanente Community Benefit on using community health workers and volunteers to reach complex needs populations. This webinar is the first of a three-part series on exploring workforce innovations in complex care. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistics. To eliminate background noise, phone lines are being muted during today's event. There will be a moderated question and answer session following today's presentations. You may submit a question online anytime by clicking the Q&A icon located in the drop-down menu of the toolbar at the top of your screen. Instructions are shown on the screen at this time. Today's event will be recorded and shared publicly on chcs.org. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you please complete a brief online evaluation that will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is very important to us, and we hope you'll take a moment to do this. I'll now turn the webinar over to Caitlin Thomas Henkel, Senior Program Officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Thank you. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Workforce Innovations in Complex Care Using Community Health Workers and Volunteers to Reach Complex Needs Populations. I'm Caitlin Thomas Henkel. I'm a Senior Program Officer here at CHCS. First, I'd like to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Kaiser Permanente Community Benefit for supporting this webinar, the first in a three-part webinar series focused on workforce innovations in complex care. Today, I am joined by my colleague, Rachel Davis, Associate Director of Program Innovation at CHCS, and David Adler, Senior Program Officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Workforce innovation remains among one of the top hot topics in requests from state health plans and providers for technical assistance, resources, and information. The field continues to innovate in the design of new delivery system and payment models that better align incentives and titrate interventions to address the full continuum of beneficiaries' complex medical, behavioral health, and social needs. In light of these reforms, we are seeing a keen focus on building the capacity of the workforce. Over the next hour and a half, you will hear from innovative providers who are integrating community health workers, volunteers, and neighborhood navigators into multidisciplinary care teams to extend the reach to patients beyond the walls of the clinic setting. First, we'll hear from Lara Shadwick at Mountain Pacific Quality Health and Jane Emmert, Director of the Assist Center in Montana, about how they're incorporating volunteers and their resource teams in rural communities to meet the needs of complex patients. Next, we'll highlight efforts by Linda Dunbar from Johns Hopkins and the Sisters Together and Reaching Team in East Baltimore about their efforts in integrating neighborhood navigators and community health workers. Finally, we'll leave sufficient time for a question and answer period that will be moderated by my colleague, Rachel Davis. A little bit about CHCS. CHCS is a nonprofit health policy resource center dedicated to improving the health of low-income Americans. We work with Medicaid agencies, providers, health plans, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We work across a few key priority areas supporting states in improving and supporting broad-based payment and delivery reform efforts, advancing innovations in care for people with complex needs, helping states advance coverage opportunities to provide high-quality and cost-effective services, and leadership and capacity building for Medicaid state officials. CHCS provides targeted training and technical assistance through learning networks and peer-to-peer -peer exchange we work directly with states to advance emerging trends and best practices and dis disseminate and spread best practices to a broader audience. As mentioned before, workforce is a relevant and cross-cutting topic in our work at CHCS. Through our portfolio of work in integrating care for people with complex needs, we're working with an array of providers to achieve the triple aim. During the webinar today, we're highlighting providers from two of our projects, the Complex Care Innovation Lab and Transforming Complex Care, who will share their stories. 
Kaiser Permanente uh, CCIL is a cauldron of innovative providers who are working in the field focused on improving care for low-income populations. They are national leaders that work to advance emerging opportunities to improve care for low-income individuals, contribute to the evidence base regarding how to successfully build, operate, and evaluate complex care programs, and serve as a leading source of policy recommendations. Transforming Complex Care is a multi-site demonstration project that's aimed at refining and spreading effective care models that address the needs of complex populations. This project is supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. With that, I would now like to turn it over to David Adler, Senior Program Officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, to provide an overview of the Foundation's vision and efforts in supporting this work. Thank you. I'm very happy to be on this call with all of you, and I'd especially like to thank CHCS for organizing this Certainly, um, Kaiser Permanente's community benefit for their ongoing support of complex care work, um, and also both of the sites that we have on the phone who are going to talk about their work. I just wanted to take a moment um, to put this work in the context of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's efforts to build a culture of health in the United States. As Caitlin said, my name is David Adler. I'm a senior program officer here at the foundation. And much of my work is really focused on our efforts to make sure that our health and healthcare systems are really meeting the needs of the populations they're designed to serve. The slide you see is our action framework. And that's really at um, a very high level how we think about and organize our work. You can see that surrounding all of our work is the idea of health equity. And that's something that we see as very central to the foundation's mission and certainly comes up in complex care where many of the populations um, who benefit from these kinds of integrated and um, comprehensive efforts are populations that really struggle to have the same health outcomes as other members of society. Um, you'll see we have four action areas making health a shared value, fostering cross-sector collaboration to improve well-being, creating healthier, more equitable communities, and strengthening integration of health systems and services. Certainly, I think you'll hear about ways that this complex care work touches on all four action areas. But I really think that, um, to put it in the context of the foundation's work, a lot of it really comes into play with action area two and four. And that's because so much of the work that we see happening and that we're very excited to be able to support really is about that kind of cross-sector collaboration and really integrating some areas that have traditionally been somewhat siloed. And that means making sure that it's not just healthcare or just social services that are working with um, certain defined populations who have really had difficulties with health outcomes. It's really making sure that these systems and services work together, that people are working across some of their traditional divisions to make sure that we're really serving the needs of the patient. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over and just wanted to thank everyone again, both for taking the time to be on this webinar and also for the work that you're doing in service of um, these very important programs. Thanks so much, David. I will now hand it over to Lara Shadwick, Director of Mountain Pacific Quality Health, and Jane Emmerich, Director of the Assist Center in Montana. Thank you, Caitlin. This is Lara Shadwick from Mountain Pacific Quality Health. And first, I'd like to thank the Center for Healthcare Strategies and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for making this work possible in a rural setting. So much of the you know programs have been developed in an urban setting, and we're grateful to be able to talk about our rural location. And I'm also um, grateful for our great partnership with uh, Kalispell Community and the ASSIST program and my colleague, Jane. So, oops. <clears throat> Mountain Pacific, uh, 
uh, Quality Health is a quality improvement organization uh, that contracts with CMS and Medicare. And we are working in Montana, Wyoming, Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, America Samoa, and the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands. And one might ask, what would all these locations have in common? And the answer is that um, we're more rural and frontier states and that we're at, um, our communities are more like islands. They're great distances um, geographically to get to our centers of population. Um, we are uh, currently working in three locations in Montana, and um, I'd like to give you a visual of uh, where, what Montana looks like. And <clears throat> the, if you stuck um, the state of Montana uh, with one corner on Chicago and the other corner on um, would end up in Washington, D.C. That's how large our state is. And there's about a million people in the state of Montana. So you can see there are lots of barriers that we have uh, towards overcoming health care in our rural location. Uh, some of those barriers are uh, geographic barriers, like I was speaking of distance to care labor shortages, particularly in nurses, specialists, and professional positions. So part of the um, work that Mountain Pacific does in the state of Montana is to uh, reduce hospital readmissions through better care collaboration. And work specifically I'm doing is uh, bringing communities together, a variety of stakeholders to improve health care uh, by meeting monthly and having uh, collaborative uh, community coalitions that discuss how to improve health care. And through that work has um, been the vision and the, uh, the collaboration that has brought our program forward. So here's, here's the slide for um, Montana. This will give you a better visual of where our three sites are. And we have one location in Kalispell, and you'll hear from my colleague Jane shortly. And um, our other location is in Helena, Montana, which is the capital of Montana, and then in Billings. So just to give you another idea, roughly to get from Kalispell to Billings is about an eight-hour drive, and there are no uh, planes in between. It's all um, just driving or teleconference. Um, each of our programs in Montana has a slightly different look. It's based on the needs of the community and the assets in place in that community. Mountain Pacific acts as the coordinating uh, element and the collaborative entity to co um, for complex care programs and work with our super utilizer patients. So a little bit about our project. Um, we, uh, Mountain Pacific Quality Health, applied for and received a nearly $1 million uh, funding project from CMS in the form of a special innovation project to work with Medicare beneficiaries. Mountain Pacific is using this money over the two-year period to apply hot spotting and transitional care model philosophies in Montana and bringing together new and existing resources and technologies to develop intervention teams called resource teams uh, where we work with our complex patients um, or super utilizer patients. Uh, Mountain Pacific has also been awarded a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant to help teams work with patients no matter what their payer sources are. We're going beyond Medicare. Um, while our efforts are focused in Billings, Helena, and Kalispell, strategies and interve interventions will be spread across the state. Um, that's particularly important in our rural setting to share what we're learning. Mountain Pacific is partnering with uh, CHCS to work um, on Montana health care systems to test, fund, and deploy resource teams to reduce unnecessary hospital readmissions, spread best practices through the development and coordination and scaling of these resource teams, and work with payers to develop sustainable payment mechanisms for community health teams. We're also looking for ways to save money through improved coordination of care across health care settings. Through Mountain Pacific Quality um, Improvement Network, we've been awarded nearly $1 million to contract um, develop resource teams in three locations, as I mentioned. Uh, this project funded work with Medicare patients only. 
Uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funding allowed us to expand the teams to work with Medicaid, commercially insured patients, veterans, um, those covered by Indian Health Services, and uninsured patients. We're working alongside similar teams funded by um, programs in Montana through a foundation called Montana Healthcare Foundation uh, to improve and share the knowledge. We're looking for ways to have collective share, tra uh, share knowledge transfer. We're also one, you know, looking at ways to sustain the work. And how do we sustain this work beyond the grants that we've found? And Mountain Pacific has been working with the state of Montana our Governor's uh, Council on Healthcare Innovations, and Montana is now uh, one of 14 CPC Plus uh, innovation sites. And that's an alternative payment model that we're hoping will be a good outlet for these teams to um, flourish beyond the grants. So what does our model look like? This is our uh, delivery system. You'll notice that the patient is at the center of our work. Um, we're calling these resource teams uh, because it takes some of the best practices and teams in a community and links them together in a community model. Many of the models that we researched in the beginning had advanced, pra advanced uh, practice nurses in them, but we had to modify our model in Montana due to labor shortages, particularly around nurses and APRN. So our model is RN-based. and. Um, they are really the quarterback and the um, coordinating entity. The RN um, is, acts as a care coordinator for the patient and does medical assessments, caregiver burden assessments, patient safety assessments, med reconciliations, and much more. The RN also coordinates with our primary care offices and helps establish that patient with uh, PCPs and often works directly with uh, that primary care provider's care coordinator in their office. There, is, um, there are community health workers and sometimes coaches that help augment the non-medical care and break down barriers to care. Many are social determinants of health, like lack of transportation, signing up for Medicaid, secure housing, or making housing safe, assistance with heating, um, meals on wheels, et cetera. Really, the work of the community health workers is a connector, and you'll hear from my colleagues shortly about the work that they're doing on that. In addition to um, the CHWs, we have a behavioral health consultant that helps the team develop strategies to work with patients because many of our patients have co-occurring mental health needs. The behavioral health consultant does not work directly with patients. That is the role that's um, filled in the community. So it's more coaching the teams on how to work with these patients. Uh, the model is an I do, we do, you do, teaching the patient self-resilience and moving them towards primary care management. The three sites we are working with all have slightly different programs based on the needs of the community and the resources that were available in place prior to the grant work. Um, Billings, for example, has a nurse and two community health workers, two of which are peer veterans. The Helena team is uh, placed in a clinic setting uh, where they interface directly with the physicians. The Kalispell team has a nurse, assist, and coaches available through a program called Journey to Wellness. All these pieces were active in this community, but it took this project to pull them together and um, be more coordinated in this fashion. So uh, another big part of our work is uh, our care co coalitions. They meet monthly and bring a variety of uh, stakeholders in the community together. So this is current work in the Kalispell community. These entities are developing the program, the positions that work within the program, and to conduct joint patient case reviews to make sure that we're meeting the, the needs. These patients are large draws on many programs in a community, and it was an easy way for everyone to start working collectively. Um, it really was an aha moment when we started addressing our first patient case review and everybody could see how that patient was impacting their program, and then they were in. It was moving forward rapidly at that point. Um, with this program, it was the first time many of these groups had met to improve healthcare. They'd worked alongside each other or worked in silos, but it was through this program that they really began collaboration. The actual intervention that um, we're describing starts at the bedside and moves with the patient out, of, out to the community. 
The team works with the patients in their home setting via an in-person visit, telephone calls, and video chats with iPads. So a little bit about the innovation at work in Montana. So one, one um, innovation that we had to adjust to in our very rural location is how do you work with uh, small teams and large geographies? And the natural inclination was towards technology. So literature supports the use of video chat uh, to forge relationships with patients. In our rural state, one community has an average of 60 miles each way to a patient. How does one make us a use of smaller teams and wider geography? It's, of course, video. We um, have been able to uh, link uh, nurses and patients together, and it's been well received by both parties. The uh, HIPAA compliant solutions like FaceTime and life size video are ideal. Skype is not compliant. Um, because of the servers. It's not on a HIPAA compliant server. Some patients cannot afford internet access so, um, or we're not comfortable with the technology. Therefore, we purchased cellular enabled uh, iPads to make sure we could connect with the patients wherever they were. There are still challenges in our rural location with cell coverage, but it is the best solution to have the iPads and have them be cellular enabled. The iPads are not left with the patients, rather the community health workers bring the iPads to the patient's home during the scheduled visit. This allows a specific time to be scheduled with the nurse, and we essentially beam her into the patient's living room or kitchen. The true benefit here is being able to see a non, the nonverbal communication. We can see the patient's dynamics at home and with family members and have a focused time on clinical issues with that patient. The use of the iPad also saves the nurse time in travel and preparation. It also allows them to stay focused on multiple cases without significant distraction, returning phone calls, et cetera. In addition, they can be used for patient education on topics like diabetes or disabilities um, benefits and the like. Another tool that we're using as an innovation is the multi-site uh, multi case reviews. How do these teams deal with very complex patients? How do they call in a lifeline? How do you get the work um, across multiple sites? And how do we work in these uh, rurally isolated teams um, dealing with emotionally stressful work with these complex patients? Often there are no easy answers and these patients are challenging personalities. The monthly case conferences are a way to connect at least seven teams across the state and experts from both Montana and other locations. University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing um, under the Team Naylor Group um, and the Transitional Care Model Experts and the Montana State University College of Nursing help us look at um, each de-identified case and uh, look for solutions that could work and help that team address that patient's needs. In addition, many um, or most of the cases have behavioral health dynamics like personality disorders, depression, anxiety, and sub substance use disorder. The behavioral health consultant is an expert that sits on the call and helps the team look for ways to work with a patient or their caregiver. Um, once again, the behavioral health consultant does not work directly with the patient, but rather works with the team. We also have a pharmacist, and they are an extremely valuable part of the team, um, especially in looking um, at polypharmacy patients, patients on multiple medications. Um, the other great uh, knowledge transfer is among peers. Uh, peers are a great source of ideas, approaches, and um, new tools to work with these complex patients. While no, no two patients are the same, there are so many common themes. Um, in addition, the peers know the challenges of working with these patients. This is a very different care from a clinical setting or floor nursing. Um, we work to create a supportive environment for these teams working with these patients. Sometimes the emotional burden or the caregiver uh, fatigue is uh, uh, tremendous, and these care conferences provide a way for uh, the team to support each other in the work. So uh, the third innovation that we're really addressing in this uh, program is around veterans. In Montana has one of the highest per capita uh, populations of veterans. One in 10 res residents are veterans. Often the patient, a spouse, or a caregiver served our country. 
and veterans connect better with those that have shared experience, common language, and understand the role of the VA in the healthcare system. It's quite different than um, many other health systems. Many recent veterans um, have been medically retired from duty but still want to stay connected with others that have served. Um, this is an opportunity for our community health worker veterans to keep uh, paying forward their service. And the hope is that the, benefit, that the benefit will be for both the service member and for the patient. Um, we're still in the early stages of this, but um, it, it's, it's going well so far. Many active duty positions uh, do not have a direct translation into the civilian world. So you have this highly skilled uh, person that's been medically discharged and don't necessarily have a way to apply their skills. And this particular peer veteran position um, allows the, the patient to, or the service member to continue working with uh, their, their skill area and be able to connect with veterans. Um, the hope is for the, is to benefit the service member and the active duty. Um, individuals uh, don't always have an easy transition um, from the service to civilian life, and many have, are still dealing with medical issues. So this is a nice way for them to still work through all those uh, different transitions into civilian life. Uh, this has also been, you know, I have this one plus one is a bigger one. And for, you know, that, that aspect I'm, I'm talking about, you have the benefits that are, these medically retired veterans have under the VA. You have now a salary and uh, work and education and career building um, for this veteran, and you get a much larger, um, more active uh, veteran to go out work with patients. So you have the, you know, the, the, it's a sal salary augmentation and the ability to work in the community in this, this setting. So a community health worker salary is roughly 12 to 15 dollars in Montana. And since a veteran has retired medical benefits, including their VA insurance, the gains come from working with the community health worker and the additional salary. The teams uh, that we are working with and developing in Billings are also looking for ways to remain flexible for our veterans so that they can still get the medical care and follow-up that they need um, and uh, still serve our patients. So it's something we're still developing and learning, but it's been very exciting to see it come together and start hearing about the interactions. And now I'll turn this over to my colleague, Jane Emeritt. Thanks, Laura. I'm Jane Emmert, and I'm the director of ASSIST in Northwest Montana. Our motto is that we are neighbors helping neighbors serve the Flathead County. We're affiliated with Kalispell Regional Hospital, which is a 343-bed facility. And our mission statement focuses on the need to connect people to the resources they need to regain their health and independence. At ASSIST, we believe in the power of volunteers to impact the lives of their neighbors who are trying to regain their health and independence. Bada County is in the northwest corner of Montana, just miles from Glacier National Park. The county, which is slightly larger than the entire state of Connecticut, encompasses over 5,000 square miles with about 92,000 people. This is a view of our valley with the mountains in the distance and our first highway bypass, which was just completed this year, in the foreground. We began ASSIST in 2014. Curtis Lund was an avid volunteer himself who knew the value of volunteering, both to the volunteer and to the community. He was also a former CASA volunteer which is an intense volunteering program where adults advocate in court for children in the foster care system. When he began to serve on the Kalispell Regional Hospital Board, he learned about the problem that needed to be solved. That was the patients who didn't succeed when they discharged home, and they kept returning to the hospital again and again. He wanted to know why. So he sat in the waiting rooms and in the ER, and he just watched. And he decided that some people just need someone to come alongside of them. 
So he created a SIST based on a volunteer model because he felt that what we would ask of our volunteers was far less demanding than what CASA had asked of him as a volunteer. He hired me as the director in January 2014 and assigned me the task of developing the program by getting out in the community to learn about the needs and the resources available. For the first two years, Mr. Lund funded the program himself, and then ASSIST came under the nonprofit foundation umbrella of the hospital in October 2016. We now have a board of directors, um, three employees that are going out into the community, and 15 volunteers going into homes. Our patients, whom we call care receivers, are referred to us by the medical staff at the area hospitals and associated clinics, and they're recognizing a patient that needs help connecting to community resources. Medical staff look at ASSIST as a team that like a good son or daughter would be who walk beside the patient and help them advocate for themselves. We provide that personal touch for those who may not have a family member in their lives. There are three departments of ASSIST, the Neighbors Helping Neighbors, which is the original heart of ASSIST, where the volunteers and staff visit, visit patients in their homes and connect them to resources. Then we added transportation and most recently a 10-bed facility called the ASSIST Center. It is a temporary 10-bed non-medical facility Neighbors Helping Neighbors started in 2014, and it was just me for the first year with a few volunteers. We served about 128 people. The next year, I was able to hire someone, and we served 220 people. And then last year, we had a full team, and we served 489 people. Our current volunteers represent people from all walks of life, but what we're searching for is an inquisitive-minded, compassionate, problem-solving volunteer who can maintain healthy boundaries and isn't afraid of going into the homes of strangers. For our training, there's an application, an interview, a reference check, and a background check, and then a three-hour orientation with a volunteer supervisor, and then most of the training is on the job because every situation is so different. We also provide monthly training lunches where we have presentations by community resource organizations to keep the volunteers and our staff educated on what's happening in the community. And we created a 200-page manual that gives them a place to start. If you're dealing with someone who's a veteran, what services are out there for them? So what we do, volunteers and staff visit the care receivers in their home and listen to their concerns. Together, we create a plan of action. And this is an example of one where the top three needs we saw the person needed were to apply for Medicaid, they had food issues, and they had steep steps to their trailer. Um, on the right, we put the tasks that the care receiver needs to do, the tasks the assist team needs to do. And then as we do those tasks, we record them. We have an Excel or a database that allows us to do that, and it's kept on a secure server. We're generally done with intensive involvement within 60 to 90 days, but we're always available. Um, our care receivers know that we care about them, and they, they call and check in with us. We make a difference, I believe, because we're face-to-face -face with our care receivers in their home. We see things that the doctors or nurses don't see in a 15-minute visit in an office. So as we listen to their concerns, meet their pets or their family members, we address non-medical issues which may be affecting their ability to afford or access medical care. So our volunteers very commonly help fill out financial aid forms, apply for Medicaid or Medicare or Social Security disability. We connect them to homemaker services um, or organizations like the Agency on Aging, which might be called the Council on Aging in other areas. We connect them to public transport, um, or our new shuttle helps get people to doctor's rides. We consider ourselves the right of last resort, but there is not a great 
public transport system in the valley. Um, the city has a narrow radius that they go. The county dial ride program could cost them $20 each way to get to a doctor's appointment, and a lot of our folks can't afford that. So we might even help them sign up for public transportation and then ride the first visit with them just to show them how to use the system. So now we have three wheelchair accessible vehicles providing over 350 rides per month, and many of those rides are over 50 miles round trip, and we're still turning down numerous ride requests each month as we're already booked. We are always encouraging them to use public transportation where it's available. We do not provide personal care, financial assistance, medical care, or housekeeping, but we might connect our folks to those resources. We started collecting data in 2016 that kind of shows on the left the number of people we connected into these different categories. And you can see that Medicaid is a huge issue, making sure they've got health insurance. Housing is a big issue out here. We have very little in the way of affordable housing and then transportation. On the right, we just started to track some of the uh, medical conditions we're dealing with, and I'm sure they shadow what many of you are dealing with as well. One thing that is unique in our valley, and Maura mentioned this, is that the Flathead Valley Service Agency has created a care transition coalition group that meets monthly. We share information. We create a web of resources to make transitions smoother for patients. And we had representatives at that meeting from hospitals, clinics, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living, Medicaid, home health, the Agency on Aging, Adult Protective Services, and pharmacies. That, I think, positioned us to qualify for a grant that started the resource program. And that resource program involves the RN, the community health worker, which is fulfilled by an assist person, and then it also has incorporated the iPad technology that Laura mentioned. The other part of the SIFT is our 10-bed medical, non-medical, short-stay facility. And it is a, intended to be for people in transition who aren't quite ready to go home. Good example, you had a hip replacement, but you live up a flight of stairs. Your, visit, your time in the hospital is over but you need a little more physical therapy to climb those stairs, you might come to the assist center. Home health would be ordered by your doctor, and you would stay with us for a short term. The greatest gift that we provide is the gift of spending time and listening. That means we can't be in a hurry. We get to slow down and listen. And then we build relationships that may allow us to speak honestly to our care receiver in a future situation. So for example, I worked with a man who had stage four cancer and the chemotherapy was leaving him weak and sick. He was down to about 120 pounds and looked skeletal. I had been in his life for a while helping him connect to various resources and I cared about him and he knew that. And one day I looked at him after he was very sick and I said, do you think you should ask the doctor what the cost versus benefit ratio is for having more chemo? Each round is leaving you sicker, and I'm not sure this is the quality of life that you said you wanted. He agreed, and he asked me to go to his next doctor appointment with him. And when the doctor began to talk about more chemo, my care receiver turned to me and said, will you ask the doctor for me? So I did. I asked the difficult question, and the doctor agreed that it was time to stop the chemo and for him to go on hospice. The good news is that on hospice, he gained weight. He traveled out of state and spent his remaining months with family and had some great quality of life. The other thing we provide to the community is a website because when families face a medical crisis, they don't know where to start looking for help. This website lets them drop into community resources on the top bar there and then look for what they might need. So a good example is you live in California, your mom lives in Kalispell, Montana, and it's time for some assisted living or respite care. You can go to our website, have live links to the organization with phone numbers to do your research a little more easily. And that's important when you're in the middle of a 
medical issue. So ASSIST is unique, I believe, because we're a volunteer-based organization. We go into people's homes and listen to their concerns and needs. Our volunteers are trained to understand the resources available in our communities. And then we focus on connecting our care receivers to resources. Most uniquely, I think, our services are free. I know everyone probably wants financial data and what this saves the hospital system. And we're working on gathering that data, but my, in my opinion, is that if we do the right thing for the care receivers, just like you would if it was your parent or friend you were caring for, then the financial value will follow. You might evaluate it by hospital nights, reduced readmissions, or Medicare dollars, but at KRMC, our core values focus on providing service with compassion, excellence, and integrity. And that's our assist focus. We believe that if we do the right thing for the right reason, the financial savings will follow. So we continue to fulfill the vision of our founder, Curtis Lund, to have volunteers come alongside of people to help them regain their health and independence. On the next slide, I just provide you our contact information so that if you want to reach me in the future, you can. Thank you very much for letting us present. Thank you so much, Jane and Laura, for those excellent presentations. Um, I'd like to just underscore the relevance and importance of using CHWs and volunteers on the ground, um, especially, you know, looking at these community-based um, models that are really tailored to meet the needs of your population. Um, and although the challenges are, may differ um, in rural and urban communities, delivering care to these really complex patients does require a diverse team of dedicated providers that can really support not only the medical needs that you touched upon, but a lot around, you know, those critical linkages and connections to the community resources. It's definitely a universal need um, that we see that spans across geographic settings. So next, I'd like to turn um, to our colleagues at Johns Hopkins, Linda Dunbar, Vice President of Population Health and Care Management, Reverend Hickman, co-founder and CEO of Sisters Together and Reaching, Demetrius Fraser, Program Managers of STAR, and Will Torrente, Community Health Worker Supervisor who will share their efforts to advance integrated community health workers and navigators in East Baltimore. Good afternoon, this is Linda Dunbar, and I want to thank, first of all, the Center for Healthcare Strategies, Kaiser Permanente Community Benefit, and Robert Wood Johnson for inviting us to share our work with you. Um, my job today is to introduce to you our um, speakers who you'll want to hear more from than you want to hear from me. Um, so my job today is to be as brief as possible in explaining to you the program that we call the Community Partnership. Our first work together began in Baltimore City with the Johns Hopkins Community Health Partnership. That program was supported by a grant from CMMI. It was a healthcare innovation award, and it was $20 million over three years, from 2012 to 2015. And in those three years, we were unable to spend $20 million, and so we had a no-cost extension year through 2016. But we launched the program in 2012, and we built on existing programs at Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins Hospital, and Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. We focused on a seven zip code area in the East Baltimore community, and that was the core of where our uh, patients in J-CHIPS resided. A few things about Baltimore City. Baltimore City population has been decreasing, and in the most recent census, we had 622,000 uh, residents in Baltimore City, 63% of whom are African American, 30% white, and another 7% um, other races and ethnicities. There are 40 zip codes in Baltimore City, 
and we were operating only in seven zip codes. But our goal of JCHIP was to transform across the continuum, transform healthcare services across the continuum from clinics to subacute facilities, hospital, home, community, and emergency departments. So who did we touch in JCHIP? We touched 3,000 beneficiaries of Medicaid and Medicare. We enrolled 1,000 adult Medicaid patients, 2,000 adult Medicare patients with multiple, multiple and complex chronic conditions. So on average, our enrollees in JCHIP had at least uh, seven chronic conditions, comorbid conditions with mental health issues and substance abuse disorders. And I'm not going to talk much right now about the model of care because we've learned from JCHIP and we've moved on to a new community partnership, a broader partnership, and I'll spend a bit of time in the next couple of slides talking about the model and the lessons we learned from JCHIP. But I do want to share with you the results, the outcomes. We had an external evaluator, um, CMS, uh, partnered with uh, NORC at the University of Chicago, and the outcomes that we achieved in JCHIP were really um, very, uh, very gratifying and um, resulted in reductions in the total cost of care, 1756 per beneficiary in Medicaid, a little less in Medicare, decreases in hospitalizations and emergency department visits in Medicaid and Medicare, and we were, we were really quite astounded that most of our respondents, when asked about our external, by our external evaluator, spoke very highly about the clinic staff and the community staff, saying that they had received information from them about how to take care of themselves. So 82% of our respondents um, had a very favorable opinion of the JCHIP community care team. Most respondents said that they trusted their community health workers and that they would recommend their community health workers to family and friends. And we built on that, that um, uh, information in terms of expanding our JCHIP program. So I'm going to talk to you a bit more now about the program that we're currently operating, which was, again, building on JCHIP. It's called the Community Health Partnership of Baltimore. And it really builds on the state of Maryland's vision for healthcare transformation across the state. And in 2015, the state of Maryland asked for proposals and awarded in 2016, uh, regional partnerships across the state of Maryland. And what the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene was envisioning is a healthcare system in which multidisciplinary teams work with high need, high resource patients to manage chronic conditions in order to improve outcomes, lower costs, and enhance patient experience. And that is exactly the work that we had done in JCHIP. We had demonstrated that we had lowered costs for the most difficult residents of Baltimore City, and we had enhanced the patient experience. Largely, I would assert, through our use of our community-based organization, community health worker model. But we were awarded a regional partnership. We were awarded $7 million a year to operate in Baltimore City. This time, um, expanding to 19 of the 40 Baltimore City zip codes. So, indeed, we have, we have uh, been awarded $7 million from the commission in Maryland called the Health Services Cost Review Commission. The six hospitals are uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital, Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center, and then four other Baltimore City hospitals. Now, mind you, these hospitals are all in a fairly small geography and operate very competitively with one another. Hopkins and MedStar, Hopkins and Mercy Medical Center, Hopkins and LifeBridge Sinai Hospital are not 
necessarily on friendly collaborative terms until we came to our sixth hospital partnership called the Community Health Community Health Partnership of Baltimore, where we all get together and say, how can we affect health, improve the patient experience across our six hospitals and across the 19 zip codes that we serve? These hospitals pay a fee to Johns Hopkins Healthcare, which is my organization, and we serve as a management services organization, and we administer six interventions. The intervention that we'll discuss today in detail is our community care team. It makes up about 50% or $3 million of our budget, so we're highly invested in our community care team. And our community-based organizations who are working with us, our Sisters Together and Reaching, who you will hear from today, the Men and Family Center, and Healthcare for the Homeless. So let me move briefly to discuss the structure of the community care teams. The community care teams, again, are based on um, existing teams in our Johns Hopkins Community Health Partnership with a bit of difference. In the community health partnership, we had one case manager and one community health worker working together as a team. And what we learned from JCHIP is that we could expand the use of community health workers. And so in this community health partnership, we have 10 regional teams that consist of a case manager, two community health workers, and a health behavior specialist on each team. And so throughout that 19 zip code geography, we operate 10 community teams. Now, a, a large part of our um, JCHIP, Johns Hopkins focused learning, was that we, um, we could have a much greater impact if our efforts were collaborative with existing community-based organizations. And so we formed a partnership and formed a program in JCHIP called Tumayini, which is Swahili for Hope, and we call the program Tumayini Hope for Health. We've built on that, again, expanding to um, more zip codes and expanding our use of community health workers in our current program. <clears throat> And I'm going to introduce you to um, a dear friend and colleague and partner in Baltimore City Health, and that is Reverend Deborah Hickman, who is the CEO of Sisters Together and Reaching. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my honor to be able to speak with you today about the value of community health workers and communities being able to help to reduce the um, overutilization of the emergency department re, uh, and to help lower the readmissions into hospitals and then to also make certain that patients understand as they go through the value of being able to access their medical provider by us engaging them around their social determinants of health. So over the last three and a half, four years of working on Tumaini under the JCHIP program, we very much, we, we had a very intimate relationship with the patients that we were allowed into their homes, allowed at their their hospital visits with their doctors and the like, and in the emergency department. And so we found that the value of patients really having a relationship with community health workers that we hired directly from the community made a massive difference in us being able to gain first and foremost entrance into their homes to sit with them and to actually take a 45 minute assessment tool that we utilized to even do a deeper dive into what was happening with them on all levels and then come back and discuss it with the case manager worked very, very well. And what we actually found in going to these patients' homes was that not only were they sick and need and need and in need of a community health worker, but also their care providers, their caregivers that lived in their homes with them had the same needs. And so the collaboration effort with JCHIP involving uh, STAR as well as the Mini Men and Family Center actually allowed us to really develop and hone our skills to make certain that we could even be able to chart what the social determinants of health were and then be able to access those um, 
resources that were needed to help these families move along the spectrum of gaining better health and having a, a successful uh, wellness plan to move forward with. And so in the beginning, we only had five community health workers, but now we have 20 community health workers that will be working with the case managers from John Hopkins, along with the behavioral health specialists, that will allow them to be able to be partnered into those 10 teams. I'm going to now introduce you to Demetrius Frazier, our manager and director for the community health workers at STAR, as well as one of the supervisors, Mr. Will Toriente. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, who are our community health workers? We hire individuals who either resided in the community that we serve or either who has had a great um, history in working within the community and had an idea of the resources that were available within the community. Um, and our relationship uh, with our community members has um, helped us a great deal. In the beginning, when we first started our um, program, we sent out an introduction letter to all of our community members uh, with a face page to introduce our organization and to explain the relationship between Sisters Together and Reaching and Johns Hopkins. And along with that introduction letter, there was a face page. And um, through that, when we first mailed that letter, we had a lot of feedback. We had clients to call the office and even visit the office who wanted to know who we were. And so that helped a great deal with that relationship bill. And through that relationship bill, we were able to um, accompany our community members to the doctor's visits. We were um, very present within clinical rounds and informing the physicians of what was going on in the homes and the lives of their clients that they did not know. Uh, we linked the clients to energy assistance, transportation, and assisting them with making their appointments to specialty appointments also. And also with that, uh, we build an, um, an individual and community capacity. We, every month we have what we call community health education series where we invite the community along with our patients and their caregivers um, either to come into our office for a nice a healthy lunch or either a nice healthy um, snack. And we talk about stress, we talk about heart disease, uh, COPD and other um, social determinants of health um, to um, provide guidance for them. And what we found is that um, with um, what some of our other members have said earlier is that the, the caregivers have burnout. So what we did was we started a, a caregiver support group where we invited to identify caregivers of our clients to come into the office and to talk to us and to explain to us the resources that they needed for themselves. And so we have had that going on monthly also. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Will Torriente. I am a community health worker supervisor at Sisters Together and Reaching. I actually started as a community health worker, but actually as an intern and then a community health worker. Um, I'd like to say that uh, CHW is vital to the community care team. We bridge the gap, we bridge the gap between the patient and, and the provider. Um, we basically use like a boots on the ground approach, um, meeting the patient exactly where they are socially and medically. Um, going into the home being non-judgmental, um, environmental scans, um, and just assessing the needs of the patient, providing patient-centered care. Um, what we want to do is find out what is actually stopping you from going to the doctor. Is it um, transportation? Um, is it lack of resources? Is it the food? What is the exact nature of the problem? And then we address that and we move on to the next issue, and that might be the medical care. Um, we promote health literacy, and we found that by promoting literacy, we've reduced readmissions, uh, reduced the frequency of the use of the emergency room. We've also linked patients to the primary care provider. Um, the patients now understand the medications, the reasons why they take the medications to medically adherent. Um, we become coaches, mentors, role models, advocates, um, informal advisors, um, almost family. We, we basically just reach out and, and try to care. I mean, if you don't have the passion for this job, this is not for you. Um, when I wake up,
wake up every day, my mindset is who can I help today and how am I going to help them. And if that is not where you are or if your spirit isn't right, if you're not there and you're not right yourself, you can't help anybody else. Um, basically, we found that the patient discloses more in their home setting. Um, they're more comfortable as opposed to being in the clinical setting. So what we try to do is find out what's going on in the home or what might be the problem with getting to the provider. Or you might have a fear of the provider. Um, some people see the provider as God. So we try to um, basically advance and talk about what's wrong, what might be the problem, what what is causing them to fear the provider, what concerns they have, what do they need to address. And we just... Um, it's patient city care. And so what you've just heard uh, Will and Demetrius describe are basically the qualities that you've been looking at for the last five minutes or so of shared life experiences. They have those experiences and they understand those experiences and especially in being the manager and the supervisor, you have to make certain that you have hired community health workers that have all of these essential attributes of being able to be relational to their patients and to the experiences that the patients are having. And it is a, a must that community health workers be actually trained when they come in the door before they actually hit the street. They go through 120 hours of community health worker training. And they make certain that they are actually prepared to go into the community and to offer the services that a lot of the patients are just waiting and it's almost like hearing them say, you know, it's been a moment since we've been able to have someone sit down and talk with us that really understands and can actually help us in crisis mode and turn things around. And so we have some great stories from the patients, but more so it's about making certain that community health workers understand what their responsibility is when they are boots on the ground and how they coordinate care for the patients and how they actually promote the patient's health and help them to gain a more critical understanding. And I think that the community and cultural liaison, that uh, um, atmosphere that the community health worker brings to the patient has been critical in our success. And I think ongoing in health and wellness that we must have more community health workers across the health spectrum to make certain that the patient's voice is also being heard and that we are also engaging them in the empowerment of being able to not only speak with their provider, but document in between their provider, their visit with their providers and when they're at home so that they can tell a complete story when they're with that um, provider that better helps the provider be able to um, write those prescriptions and understand where the patient is at. Because if you don't know your patient is homeless and you're writing a prescription that needs to be re refrigerated or that needs or requires a meal and that patient has no way or doesn't feel comfortable in stating that because they think that they're going to be judged, they won't share. But we've been able to help them to gain that sense of empowerment to make certain that they feel good when they sit with their providers. So. So um, next up, we want to actually talk a little bit about the Neighborhood Navigators from the Men and Family Center. The Men and Family Center is not uh, here today, but however, I can tell you that they have been good partners with us in terms of when we are working with patients that actually live within a four block radius of where the Neighborhood Navigators are located. They can go block by block and make sure that they're doing like a daily check-in, but also they've been critical to us being able to work with them around the patients that do not have or people in the community that do not have health insurance and need to get health insurance, they become a very excellent resource to guide those family members to, to help them be able to come into their center 
center and work with another group that's housed within their center to get health insurance and also to work with them around the areas of concerns that they have. And they have actually resided in the community to work directly with community members, whether they had insurance or no insurance. And they document their, their work through a system called RedCap that allows us to look on a month-to-month -month basis to see how many patients that they help to get health insurance, how many patients that they help to get um, gas and electric, get stable housing, and even down to getting into workforce development. So the Neighborhood Navigators uh, general primary roles were to actually inform and monitor, as I've already been saying, and do the surveillance of patients or, or their family members in their communities relative to the unmet needs and doing capacity building and mobilization of the neighborhood residents. And these pictures you can see that they also go through some in-depth training. That picture looks very crowded because they would have weekly trainings on how to actually mobilize, how to engage, and how to then help also identify resources that were needed. They even uh, work with us when we do our trainings. We do it, we actually make sure that all of the community health workers as well as the neighborhood navigators were trained in CPR as well as in mental health first aid, which is critical with the patients that we actually see because that not only do they have multiple comorbidities, but they have also um, mental health issues, HIV and AIDS and other issues that are going on that we need to make certain that we have great ears to listen and discern so that when we come back to work with the uh, health behavior specialist as well as the case manager, that we're building a very good care plan, not just for the patient, but with the patient, of the things that the patient really wants to work on first and foremost to get them into that space where they're feeling empowered and they're moving forward. One, one last um, in, bit of information about the Neighborhood Navigators is that the JCHIP Neighborhood Navigators are operating in a zip code 21205. And so through our enhanced partnership with six hospitals, we have um, built in money into our annual budget so that we can replicate this program in other neighborhoods. Our next neighborhood will be in a part of Baltimore that is close to one of the MedStar hospitals called Cherry Hill. And it is a very challenging neighborhood, um, quite a distance from the current model but there we hope to engage other community-based organizations. The Men and Family Center would serve as a uh, training, you know, and expert, but would not be traveling to another neighborhood in Baltimore, but we would hire or contract with another community-based organization in the Cherry Hill neighborhood. So that is our replication plan for expanding the uh, neighborhood navigation program. So I think in the interest of time, um, we are ready to turn it back to CHCS and um, would uh, invite your questions and comments. Great. Thank you so much. This is Rachel Davis from CHCS, and just a huge thanks to the presenters from Montana and Baltimore. Um, such excellent presentation, and um, you guys are your programs are so impressive. You should be really proud of the work that you're doing. We will use the last 15 minutes or so here to take questions from the audience. Um, you'll see uh, instructions here on how to submit questions. If you go up to the top of your toolbar, you should see a drop-down option to submit um, a question through the chat feature. Um, we've already gotten quite a few questions, and so I can already predict that we're not going to be able to make our way through all of them today, but we'll certainly do our best to uh, go back to the presenters and for any questions that we're not able to get to today, we'll do our best to uh, compile answers for them and post them or send them out in some fashion to those of you um, who are in attendance today. So um, I will kick off the Q&A session. Um, first is a question from Montana. 
And then uh, with a question for Johns Hopkins that we've gotten. Um, Mon for the Montana folks, Jane and Laura, one of the first questions that we got, and um, I'm not sure, Jane, you might be better positioned to speak to this, but both of you should certainly chime in here, is um, if you could clarify the difference between the role of the coach on the resource team and the role of the CHW. So the resource team is comprised of the nurse and a community health worker, but we pull in other resources, and one of the resources we can connect to is a local summit wellness center where they have life coaches that we can also connect people to that will help them learn new diets, new exercise programs, cardiac care, or diabetic education. Great. And this is a question actually that was coming up for me, and I'm now seeing some questions come in around this as well. And I think it's a question for both the Hopkins folks and um, the Montana folks is how are how do you guys approach uh, integrating the CHWs into the care team and also ensuring that their work isn't duplicating any of the of the other roles on the team? This is um, Linda Dumba from Hopkins. Uh, one way is that we um, have been challenged but um, are doing the work of integrated workflows. So that in our model, uh, the community health worker makes the first point of contact with our um, enrollees and they do a social determinant screen, they do an assessment of needs, they bring that back to Sisters Together in Reaching and meet with the case managers so they, they can de develop one plan of care and, um, and, you know, kind of a di division of responsibilities based on whether the needs are more care coordination medical versus, um, you know, social, uh, social determinant driven. Uh, and so that, um, unfortunately, I'll, I'll be honest about this, um, we don't have one place to document our plan of care and to document our ongoing interactions with patients, um, partly because our electronic medical record is where the case managers and health behavior specialists document and Sisters Together in Reaching Community Health Workers do not have access into our Hopkins medical record. So we need to um, work with our HIPAA folks at Hopkins, our HIPAA lawyers and our, um, you know, our, uh, our administrative staff so that we can have a decision for the community health workers to be viewed as part of our team and document fully in the medical record. But we, we have not um, achieved that yet. We've not met that goal yet. And this is Laura from Montana. Um, one uh, tool that we're using is a care coordination software, which um, allows our nurse to be the lead in the coordinator. She is the one that drives the communication. And what's nice about this software tool, um, which is called CrossTX, is that it um, allows the non um, hospital EHR systems to communicate with um, the nurse. So that would be things like um, Medicaid or Meals on Wheels or um, Assist and have one coordination platform uh, that we work with. So in design, the nurse is still the leader and there are regular coordination processes that, Jane, I don't know if you want to talk about further. No, I just think the important thing is that the medical records are still protected in that in that option. Only people who have a need to know are invited in for each care receiver. Great. Thank you guys for thoughts on that front. So we're I'm just getting the questions pouring in here, but there's actually a lot of overlap and a couple of themes or I'm seeing a couple of themes in the questions that we're getting and one of them is related to funding. So could each of you, Montana and the Baltimore team, um, 
speaks to how you are able to fund these particular roles. I know you have talk, spoke about it to some extent, but um, just a little bit more in detail there and specifically speak to whether Medicaid plays a role in funding these roles. Now, this is Linda Dunbar from Hopkins, and I'm going to explain the Maryland system, which is unique in that we're the only state in the union who has this kind of funding. Um, we have a waiver, the state has a waiver from the Medicare uh, prospective payment system payment. And so Maryland is able to have one commission who sets rates for our 32 hospitals in, in the state. And, uh, and I'll share with you for Johns Hopkins Hospital, for example, this rate setting commission gives the hospital about two and a half billion dollars. I hope I don't get fired for sharing financial secrets, but the, the uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital gets two and a half billion dollars per year to care for the residents in their catchment area. Now that includes what the rate setting commission would call population health of the surrounding zip codes. So when the rate setting commission said, why don't all the hospitals in Baltimore City get together, come up with a joint plan for addressing population health and decreasing utilization of hospitals across the city of Baltimore? We did that with six hospitals in Baltimore. There are a few on the west side of Baltimore who did not join us, but we got from this rate setting commission a grant of $7 million a year to care for Baltimore City residents. Again, it's a unique program, but we are then able, um, my organization is the management services organization, Johns Hopkins Healthcare, we get the $7 million across all the hospitals and then distribute it to community-based organizations. So that's how we're able to fund it. It's not a system that exists in any other state. Um, and if Obamacare was repealed, would not exist in the state of Maryland either, likely. So we're very, very sensitive about what's happening um, on a policy, a federal policy level, because it would essentially mean the end of our program and the end of our Maryland waiver. And this is Laura. In Montana, I'm going to answer this question in two ways. So um, the CMS Special Innovation Project Award and the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation Award allowed us to um, develop these teams um, in communicating with hospital administrations early on. So this project actually started about two years ago. There was that reluctance to fund FTEs. Um, of, you know, in the hospitals that would move this care out of the clinic. They just weren't ready yet. There was, it's that chasm when you're moving from um, high volume care to quality incentive based care. And so this project has allowed us to um, basically pilot and show the proof of concept. And um, more recently, about this summer, Montana got the opportunity to um, apply for Comprehensive Primary Care Plus pilot site. And that is um, a program out of um, care um, to, develop, to develop an alternative payment system that is really per member per month patient driven and has uh, specific variables uh, criteria for payment structure. So payment is based on risk stratification and the uh, complexity of the program. And in CalSpell specifically, there's nine sites that were awarded this uh, program. It is a blended funding stream from Medicare, Medicaid, in Blue Cross, and um, Pacific Source, which are two of the commercial insurers in our state. And same type of uh, payment structure, and they all exist in the outpatient clinics. So that money goes directly to the outpatient clinics, and that is our hope as we develop these that they can sit in these outpatient clinics or find homes within the hospitals. So really it was a lot of the work that um, helped develop DC+. So I want to piggyback on that question a little bit and go actually into a question around staff retention. You know, one of the things that I've heard um, 
talked about in discussions about CHWs that there can be challenges um, just in finding the right way to support them and um, retaining them. And, you know, I think one of the strategies that um, folks have used is, um, you know, the salary that they pay CHWs. So, um, Laura, I think you mentioned that. But I'm curious if either of you wanted to talk a little bit about that or other strategies that you found to help with um, retention and supporting the workforce. So this is Reverend Hickman from uh, Baltimore, and uh, in, as it relates to the retention of community health workers, we've had, uh, I would say, I'm going to say middle of the ground with CHWs because we hired them directly from community, and a lot of them sometimes come, and this is my transparency, come with um, work ethics that cause them not to fare so well. But for those that actually come in that have had prior um, health care experience, they have been the ones that have done very, very well. I would say our retention rate is probably in the area of about 60 to 70 percent. For an example, our, our manager and director of the community health workers has been with us from the very beginning. Uh, Ms. Toriente has been with us now for the last two years, and he came in as an intern, as he stated, but he has already moved into the position of supervisor and does an extraordinary uh, job with working with his team. And each supervisor, supervisor, there are two of them that we have employed, has a team of 10, and I would say each of them have lost at least one person since this um, project has started, the program has started, and so that's not too bad over uh, almost close to a year. We've been really doing pretty good, and we don't have a problem when we actually solicit or um, put out a um, want or an ad for, I was going to say a want ad, forgive me, when we actually put out an ad uh, for CHWs, we get like an, a bulk of like 300 applicants applying and that we have to go through them and really find those persons that actually understand the art of working with patients, the art of communication, and that are really good at identifying resources, but more so have the ability to um, be able to document appropriately and that we feel will be comfortable in working with the case managers as well as the providers, because sometimes providers do call and want to speak directly with the person that has been working with their patient. That's great. Thank you so much, Reverend Hickman. Montana Post, did you have any thoughts on that front? So as far as the, this is Laura again, as far as the community health worker piece goes, um, we're still in the early stages of the veteran peer piece, but you know, funding-wise, when you can take a $12 to $15 an hour job and augment it with um, a VA benefit, th these folks are thrilled. You know, they're, they're thrilled to be um, involved in this program. And I don't have any data yet. Um, you know, some of the things that we've learned through our friends at CUNY, our Center for Healthcare Strategies is the importance of finding uh, people that can strike relationships and uh, can be flexible in their and be solutions oriented. So Montana is still developing their uh, community health worker program right now. Um, our partners at AHEC at um, Montana State University are still developing the curriculum and the training and the certification process. So, you know, we're still early on in the journey in Montana. Terrific. All right. Well, I was about to get, I was able to get to about 2% uh, of the questions that came in. So, as I said, we will, as a team, go back and um, to the extent that we can answer the, the questions that you all asked that we weren't able to get to during this webinar, we'll certainly work to get those um, answers pushed out to you guys in some format. Um, I just wanted to use the last few minutes here to uh, talk about um, opportunities 
Um, Travis, I'm sorry, I'm not able to get to the next slide. If you could, if you guys could move it over to the next slide for me quickly, that would be great. Um, I just wanted to plug two additional webinars that we have coming up on uh, this topic of uh, workforce. So the, first, the next one is going to be May 11th. It's around community paramedicine. And the one after that will be June 22nd, and it will be around using community pharmacists for our complex care management. Um, we'll be sending out the registration links for those uh, webinars shortly. And then uh, last but not least, I just wanted to quickly encourage you all to visit our website, sign up for our e-alert. We have actually three resources, um, two that are out there right now. The first actually was a, a blog that Linda Dunbar, uh, we did an interview with her and we're able to turn that into a blog post. So for those of you that are interested in learning more about um, the JTA program, Sisters Together in Reaching, uh, Men and Family Center and the Neighborhood Navigator position, um, go to our website, look for that blog. We also, uh, Meryl and Caitlin, recently put out a terrific blog piece about integrating CHWs into care teams, lessons from the field. And we're really excited about a forthcoming issue brief, which is going to take a deeper dive into ways to integrate CHWs into the care team. So again, I encourage you all to visit our website, sign up for our e-alerts, keep your eyes out for the registration links. Um, Thank you so much to the presenters. Again, thank you to Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and KP Community Benefit. Thank you to those of you who attended today and gave your time to this. I um, also want to thank my CHDS colleagues for pulling this together, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Take care.